Um, yeah, hi, um, I'm Charlotte Miller. Um, I'm the lead strategist of the Finance Innovation Lab, which is a network of people who are changing the finance system so that it's more democratic, responsible, and fair. Um, and I'm Tilly, or Matilda Murday, and I work at the Democratic Society, which is an organisation which works to change democracy, improving it, and increasing participation with citizens. And I am the Chief Policy Officer, and I lead on all our EU projects. So, Matilda, why do you do what you do? I'm sure that's the question. I wasn't, <laughs> wasn't sure of my answer. I do what I do because I believe that we can make a genuine change. And when I was younger, I was very keen on doing that in a slightly more radical, maybe unrealistic way. And the folly of youth, or the narcissism of youth, made me think that I had all the answers. And as I've grown older, I've realised that's very much not the case. And the collective intelligence that people have is the most important tool that we have to create really good policy and policy that really works for people. And if it's not democratic, then it doesn't really count to my mind. And uh, Democracy is fab. I would love to have lived under one, but I'm sure that there's no one in the world who has. But Excuse I think me, I don't so know what Moxie is, and I don't know where all these other places are that we could move around. There's been no introduction whatsoever oh. to the whole day. Okay. And I want to go. I've just been looking at it very quickly, and I'd like to go to other places. Can I be totally honest? We've only got 15 minutes, and we don't work for Compass, so probably so how, we're not going to be Is there anything to Compass here? Sure, that's fine. Um, so everyone having their say, which is <laughs> obviously the most important thing. Um, so why do you do what you do? Um, I think it goes back to where I grew up. I'm from a small town in Scotland called Helmsburg, just north of Glasgow. Um, beautiful countryside on the edges of the national park, so gorgeous, um, but also um, when I was growing up, it had some of the, well, the West Coast had some of the worst economic and social deprivation in the UK. So I kind of knew um, through my classmates that we didn't live in a meritocracy, like that some people just um, start with, you know, their hands tied behind their back. And uh, for example, one of my classmates was um, in a children's home and, you know, she was just as bright as me, fun, full of life, but you know, she would follow any sign of affection she could. So the age old story, by 16 she was pregnant, dropped out of school, I went to university and our lives are, you know, completely other ends of the spectrum now. I and mean, it's just, it's not fair. And I guess that sense of social justice has just stayed with me. I have a question here, because despite the accent, I actually grew up um, outside of Glasgow, and in Glasgow. And I do wonder slightly, I, when I was at school, we had um, a human rights group, and actually there was quite a lot of uh, discussion all the time about what democracy was and what human rights were. And there are a lot of people from Scotland, uh, in uh, the UK, who are generally working on democratic projects. And I find that really interesting, I wonder why that is. So I'm just looking down the questions then. So I know that you um, were keen to talk about what you would do if you had uh, if you had five years to change something. What would that be? Well, I think one of the things that is very noticeable is that people don't seem to realise that they're winning. We've almost won the argument about how to open up democracy. That people are more important than those that govern them and they have a, should have a greater say over how their country is run and how their lives are run. You have things like the Open Policy Making Team the Cabinet Office, who I know also works with your lab. Um, you have things like the Speaker's Commission on Digital Democracy, which has been consulting over how you improve democracy through digital means. And they've recently written a report, which is quite interesting to look at, um, including getting online voting, including having everyone understand how Parliament works. And, um, quite short time scales. Now, at the moment, there's a lot of movements to try and get people involved in democracy, but unfortunately, those things aren't being adequately communicated to the government and vice versa. And this is the government's fault largely, and also people like me who work in the democratic sector who find it difficult to reach out and tell people that these things are happening. And it means that those um, initiatives and those processes can't be taken advantage of. If they're not taken advantage of, they may as well not even exist. Because it doesn't really matter if there's a process happening, if no one's getting involved, then no one's getting involved. Um, at the Democratic Society, we work on a project called NHS System, which is actually a new piece of infrastructure, 
within the NHS, which talks directly to the NHS the board, where every single person in the country will have a say over how policy is made there. And that's incredibly important. And actually, the problem is that there's a lack of trust. So if you talk to people about this, one of the fears that they have is that it's just another way for the NHS to put through policies that they want and pretend that they're listening. And until we um, give up some of our fear factor and say, yes, for a little while, for these five years, we're going to pretend that we trust the government and we're going to go through with this stuff, then maybe we can achieve something. But if we don't trust, if we don't take that leap of faith, we're not going to be able to use those initiatives to change the world. People do get burnt, so um, the Open Ministry Finland, who um, worked incredibly hard to crowdsource new ideas for governance, put through something for um, legalisation of same-sex marriage. When Parliament put it through, it was a law, they turned up and they said thank you on the mass outside the Parliament building. You can't really get better press than that as a government. This is something that they want. But the Finnish government have pushed back on six of the last initiatives, and therefore people using Open Ministry are very angry. I think we do have to try and we have to build that trust, we have to think that it's going to happen, but we also have to be prepared that we might be let down, and that when we're let down we need to push even harder. Um, so these initiatives that are happening, particularly um, the policy making ones, we just need to get involved and we need to make sure that our voices are being heard, because at the moment it's already the people who know the system, it's the people who have money and resources, who know when these processes are happening, that are getting involved, and we need everyone's voices to be heard. Um, and partially, obviously, that's down to people like me, making sure that people know about this stuff, but partially that's also that leap of faith and that trust. So yeah, that's why we're doing the next one. Fantastic. Um, it just makes me think about um, the question of like why I haven't accepted the status quo, because it feels like um, it's not that the ideas aren't there, but there's kind of cultural and structural barriers that are disabling us as a democracy. And, um, I think that's one of the things that I just can't accept. I can't accept that, um, you know, we live in this atomized individualistic culture that's kind of held up by our neoliberal economic model. And it's, it's really, um, it's kind of pernicious and it erodes our ability to participate. Any kind of collective action is, um, you know, it's not seen as kind of normal. And there's so many kind of barriers in the way now and people who are, you know, we've got to work so hard to pay our mortgages, everybody's at work, we don't have any time to participate in democracy, or you just, you know, um, you're on the wrong side of our incredible inequality, and you have no um, kind of, you know, you've got no um, ability, or, you know, that's eroded by the kind of economic structures that we're in. So, and I just, and I think what it's, what it's making us become is, anathema to who we really are you know i don't i don't i don't believe that we're these cold rational competitive beings i think we're compassionate i think people we need each other and we want to participate um and i think i particularly feel that as a woman you know at work you're kind of like no you know compete win um and i just refuse to kind of shut down who i am as a human being um to fit the cultural norm but i also think that people need to recognise their own value and recognise, I mean, qualitative information, information about their lives, their lived experience. Yes, they need to be heard, but at the same time, they also need to realise that actually that has a huge value. Mm -hmm. And I think that this can be a personal decision as well, where we say, we don't know enough about this. I mean, how many times I've spoken to young people about politics, and they say, I don't know anything about politics. You ask them about a specific thing, of course, they know everything about it, because it's the life they live, it's the country they live in. And they're, they're fully aware of how things affect them. And uh, there needs to be a culture change, yes, absolutely needs to be a culture change. But a lot of that's just about confidence. And in fact, if you're talking about inequality, this is one of the things that's most noticeable. You find people who are from well-off backgrounds, who are from backgrounds where they've um, been told all the time, you can succeed and you'll be amazing. It's having that confidence. And actually, that's so damaging not to be told that, not to be told that you're great and, and your opinion matters and you're really valid. And we need to make sure that everybody's hearing that, particularly young people. Um, but the culture change within government is a different one because we have, as Andy Williams who's in the audience, will say positive deviants, which is obviously a bit of a, a saucy way to put it, but nevertheless, who are, who are in there and are trying. We just need to take that tiny, tiny gap that we're given and just crank it wide open and make sure we're there when we have given the opportunity to do it. But yeah, absolutely. 
Um, it just makes me think about what, what you're saying, that we find a similar thing in the work that I do, is which is effectively building networks of people who are, so um, in the Finance Innovation Lab, we build a network of people who are trying to change finance, and there's loads of great stuff going on. You know, there's heaps of innovation in finance that is making it, um, you know, this big kind of revolution to democratise finance. Um, but like you were saying, it happens in pockets. It happens in pockets and it happens against the odds of the incumbents and the, the power imbalance. You know, they've got a massive sway over um, government policy. Um, you know, the, the lobby in the finance industry is incredible. So, um, so I think there's something about we need to build collective power um, and we need to, um, what we find consistently is we need to invest time, energy, belief in people who are creating alternatives and connect them up together. Um, and almost always I find that building community is one of the things that unlocks the potential of people who are trying to change things or do things differently, which again is at odds with this individualistic, be a hero, you know, you can do it. You can't <laughs> on your own. So um, it, it seems so kind of simple that it's just a basic human need if we can meet that and build community of people who are trying to change things and, and then build that confidence um, that that is one of the things that can really accelerate change. I mean, these communities already exist, so it's basically about building the pathway, isn't it? And I think Andy mentioned earlier when I spoke to him that it's also there's a translational element um, where, you know, government is talking a different language to people, and that's incredibly problematic itself. I mean, in fact, I, I'm definitely, definitely do that all the time. The jargon is the worst thing in the world I find myself doing it, and it's about kind of getting past that. So I have a question for you. Uh, okay, what are we going to do about politics? That's a pretty broad question. Jesus. <laughs> okay, yeah, go on then. What are we going to do about politics? Um, so I... If you can answer this, will be incredibly <laughs> Well, I'll just pick up some clues from what I'm learning through um, building these networks. That, so I think there's something about stay, stay radical. Don't dilute your vision. Of, if you want something fundamentally different, don't do the kind of, okay, we will negotiate with the powers that be. Hold on to that. Um, get organized. You know, ha be super strategic. I've learned a lot from working with um, a coach to entrepreneurs. And so I think we often are a bit kind of flabby in our change efforts in civil society. So get really, really ruthless about you know, what you're trying to do. Get really focused collaborate, find people, like we work with positive deviants as well, it's like some mainstream financial institutions. Um, and I think, you know, um, and I know Compass is really big on this as well, it's like embody the kind of culture you want to see. Like that is also a, a, a real game changer, I think. So that's not, I don't do that in politics, but I think that if you could, you know, hold a radical vision, get organized, be strategic, and create a culture of um, collaboration and compassion, like, that could help, I think. Well, I mean, what do I think? Um, so, in terms of changing politics, I mean, there's all the kind of standard stuff I do, so, uh, you know, lobbying reform, financial reform, electoral reform, you know, do all that, get that out of the way first. But I think, I think one of the things we need to do is to make sure that the right people are getting elected, and at the moment they're not, it's not representative. And that's, partially down to this confidence thing, that's partially down to believing that you can do something and believing that I think everything's open to you, but it's also about the actual facilities to do that. At the moment, it's very difficult if you don't have a party behind you, for example. Um, not everyone believes in the ideology of the specific political parties. It's very difficult if you don't have financial backing. What is it? I think it's five grand to run as PCC, is that right? Uh, I think that's the deposit. I mean, that's obviously not a reasonable amount of money. Um, and so I would bring in a wider variety of voices and try and make sure that people are being properly represented, but not through quotas. I would do it through um, encouraging and building those platforms for people to use. Um, yes, yeah, so I think we're, we're nearly finished, but I'll just kind of under, undermine that, that I've found that consistently in my work, it's not enough just to say, oh, we don't have you know diversity in the room. Like You have to get really strategic about building those pathways for people who have economic and cultural barriers to them participating and showing leadership. So now we, we really do that and we um, kind of try and dismantle these invisible barriers of privilege and um, really build the power of those who are most affected 
by the problems that we see. I do.